Royal hunting lodges were very popular with the kings of medieval England, and John was no exception. He loved nothing more than to travel between his lodges and palaces to hunt deer and wild boar in the royal forests. Just an arrow's flight away from our site is Sherwood Forest, where King John and his courtiers would have enjoyed days out hunting deer. But the abundant wildlife in the forest also attracted some unwanted attention, as Alex and Mary Ann are finding out. So what would the forest have been like, Tony? Um, well, around here it was quite open. Um, it wasn't really that dense, that thick. There was lots of open spaces and, and so on. That's where the, uh, um, the huntsmen would really do what they needed to do. You couldn't just go in there. Uh, you know, you had to have special permission. Only foresters and verderers and people like that were allowed to go in there. Almost a third of England's countryside was designated royal forest and commandeered for the king's pleasure. And as the forest became a playground for the nobility, forest law kept peasants out, denying them access to woodland that for generations had supplied them with meat, firewood and building materials. This bred resentment and forced some to turn to poaching for survival. There were gangs of poachers, of course, that would move about. And, of course, this is where this, this kind of Robin Hood idea comes from. Well, yes and no. Um, I mean, again, Robin Hood is uh, uh, just a single character when there are absolutely uh, hundreds you could pick. Right. Robin Hood is just the one that everybody knows about. Um, Robin from the rich and giving to the poor. Rubbish, really. He robbed from the rich and kept it. He robbed from anybody and kept it himself. <laughs> It's <laughs> shameful. I'm assuming that if you were caught for poaching, the punishments would be quite harsh. Oh, yeah, they were terrible. Um, all kinds of things uh, could happen to you. Um, you could have had your hands cut off or your eyes put out, uh, your ears locked, your nose could have been split or cut off. That's a mark of shame, I'm assuming. Yeah, you yeah, can't absolutely. ever go back and do it again. Well, yeah, I mean, you're not going to be able to draw a bow if they've cut one of your hands off. So, uh, yeah, it was... Um... Plenty of incentive then to go vegetarian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Medieval hunting sites mean feasting, and great rituals were attached to the butchery of deer, notably the unmaking, in which the dead animal was systematically divided up. Mary Ann's getting her hands dirty to find out which of the hunters got the lion's share of the venison. So now we've gutted and skinned it, what do we do next? Uh, well, we've got to uh, 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 quarter it up. It's called the unmaking of the deer. The whole thing is called the unmaking of the deer. Various cuts would go to various people. The pelvis goes back to the kill site as an offering to the uh, uh, corbies or crows. That's pretty ritualistic. It sounds yeah, pagan. Very much so, very much so, yeah. But it was just something they did, it's something they carried on doing. The, uh, the left foreleg would go to the huntsman, the forester. The right one would usually go to his assistant. The haunches, these are the prized possessions. This is what ends up on this, the noble's table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Let's get it on the barbie. But this act of preparation can leave clues for archaeologists. So what do the bones we've found on our site tell us? Anyone fancy a deer burger? <laughs> <laughs> go on, Phil, you have the first one. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> 